Welcome to From AMIA to Armistice, a series of podcasts commissioned by UCL Institute of Education. I'm Simon Bendry, Director of the UCL Institute of Education's First World War Centenary Battlefield Tours Programme. In August 2018, students from across the United Kingdom joined students from France, the United States, Canada and Australia on the Western Front to commemorate the Battle of Amiens. This series, recorded largely on location during that battlefield tour, tells the story of the Battle of Amiens in the wider context of the First World War and the road to armistice. In this podcast, we are at the German cemetery at Freecourt. Um, just want to have a safety notice, guys, you're going to be coming out onto a main road. The entrance to the cemetery is behind you on the left-hand side. Can I ask you to come off the door at the front, cross over and be very careful, look left and look right. Cars just come flying around. I'll be standing in the middle of the road, stop getting people coming at you. My name is Hugh Strawn. I'm Professor of International Relations at the University of St Andrews. I'm in the German cemetery at Freecourt on the Somme battlefield. Many British visitors in particular comment on the comparative absence of German cemeteries and German graves on the battlefields of the Western Front. This is perfectly understandable if you think about the context. First, Germany is the invader. And for France, in the immediate aftermath of the war, the notion that German dead should be buried here and commemorated here reflected a national humiliation which they found extraordinarily hard to stomach. Now, in the spirit of reconciliation, that isn't at all the position that France would take, but it was understandably the case then. So what tended to happen, and this is the second point, is that the Germans created what we now call concentration cemeteries. They collected the dead and put them in a limited number of locations. Typically, when you come to a German cemetery on the Western Front, you will see a collection of crosses, but one cross represents up to four soldiers, with each arm of the cross carrying a name. So four soldiers for each grave. And then on top of that, there are ossuaries, collections of bones, which are from all over the battlefield, brought together here in a massive communal grave, with the names of those who have been identified as within those graves separately listed. Not all of them listed, because of course many of them were unidentifiable. For a British visitor coming from a typical Commonwealth War Graves Commission cemetery, which aspired in many ways to be like an English country churchyard, with their white headstones, their regular planting lines and their well-maintained borders, there is a marked contrast. Here you come in to see row upon row of plain black metal crosses with simple white lettering. And the black is particularly stark when contrasted today with the scorched grass as a result of a long hot summer. The atmosphere is dark, it's forbidding. And that is true of cemeteries on other fronts built by the Germans, a connotation of a Teutonic Valhalla for many. The striking thing too about the care of the cemeteries is whereas in the British case and in the French case this is a national responsibility in the German case this is in the hand of an independent charity the VDK the Volksdeutsche Kriegsglauben they have some support from the German Foreign Office because their cemeteries lie in the grounds of invaded countries particularly in the former Soviet Union for the Second World War So diplomacy is central to the German care of their cemeteries. Contrast that with the overwhelming British experience of the First World War, their share in the defence of countries like France and Belgium, who freely and willingly gave the land on which British graves lie. At Freecourt, because it's a concentration cemetery, graves of Germans buried elsewhere during the course of the fighting were brought here in the aftermath of the war, and one of those was Manfred von Richthofen, the German air ace, the Red Baron, who was killed in 1918. The circumstances of his death and who was responsible are one of those perennial controversies in aviation history. At the beginning of 1914, air power is about reconnaissance. 
it's not about fighting in the air. In the course of 1914 to 16, reconnaissance aircraft begin to think of ways of attacking each other. In particular, how they could mount a machine gun on the front of an aircraft so that it could actually shoot down another aircraft, an achievement reached in 1915 itself. In 1916, you get fighter aircraft forming squadrons, so they hunt in groups. That produces a capacity to establish air control, the dominance of a particular part of the airspace, at least for the duration of a battle. The Germans do it in the early planning and preparation for the Verdun Battle of January, February 1916. The French respond in the course of Verdun by establishing their own squadrons, including the famous Escadrille Lafayette, the American squadron formed before the United States entered the war. The British do it over the Somme battlefield in the second half of 1916. In 1917, the Germans fight back with the Fokker, the triplane, trademark aircraft of Richthofen, painted red colours in his case, which is why it's the Red Baron. With this aircraft and its superior manoeuvrability and speed, they establish air control, at least for the course of that year. These air aces become national heroes for all air forces, liberated from the constraints of trench warfare. They become symbols of a more gallant and chivalric form of warfare. But they are, of course, ruthless killers. They need to be to survive in the airspace. They're also masters of a new technology, not a throwback to an old world of knightly behaviour. They behave in knightly terms to each other. Richthofen is treated with great reverence and honour by the British when he is buried after he is killed. But in the air, these pilots are masters of new machinery and their capacity to master that machine and understand it is one embodiment of industrialised warfare. You have been listening to From Amiens to Armistice, a Chrome Radio production for UCL Institute of Education. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. In our next podcast, we visit the Memorial to the Missing at Tiepval.